Hi, everyone. Um, I'm JP Gill, and I'm a designer on the Android Wear team, and I led the design for bringing material designs to wearables. Hi, I'm Paul Sulos. I'm an engineer on the Android Wear team, and I built some of the material design library features. Material design is a key aspect of Wear 2.0. Today, we're going to talk about how you can design and build apps for Android Wear using Google's design guidelines called material design. After we go through some design principles, I'm going to show you how to build an app using some of the new components. Material design is Google's visual language. It's been designed to work across multiple platforms, devices, and screen sizes. It provides a toolkit for designers and developers, along with a comprehensive set of guidelines and design principles. This image on the screen is an abstract representation of different screen sizes, going from the big TV on the screen uh, on the back to desktops, tablets, phones, and the white little small dot there, that's a watch screen. Today, we'll focus on the little screen, and we show you how we extended material design to work on wearables, and how we will help with design apps. If you want to know more about material design, please visit design.google.com. Material design for wearables can be described in three key areas. We focus on vertical layouts to improve simplicity and usability. The use of dark colors, which are less interruptive and can save battery on OLED displays, and a set of new UI components and app design patterns that help designers create great-looking apps, developers build apps more quickly, and users have a more consistent app experience. Material Design on Android Wear 2.0 isn't just for apps, and it extends across the system. The principles used in apps are observed in other system components like notifications, the app launcher, input mechanisms on the device, and other parts of the system. Here you can see a few app illustrations designed with these principles. Layouts are vertical. They use darker colors and also have some UI components and app design patterns. Let's talk about vertical layouts. Originally, we left things really open in Android Wear. We saw developers and users get confused with the freedom to scroll left, right, up, down, in all directions, basically, in apps and the OS. We found that restricting the primary axis to just the vertical axis just helps people orient themselves and get things done. The notification stream on Android Wear 2.0 is one of the core examples of this vertical principle. Users navigate vertically, starting from the watch face, to check their incoming notifications. Once they open a notification, as you see on the right image, the notification expands vertically to reveal more content and more actions. Sometimes your app may need a horizontal container, and that's also OK. For example, if you have an inline photo carousel in your app. What is really important in this case is that your users understand the hierarchy of your app. They need to understand that this, vertical, this horizontal container is contained within a vertical container, the parent container, and that's OK. So it's important for, the, for users to understand that the main axis of the app is vertical. Dark colors are a central part of material design for wearables. Previous UIs on Android Wear use the light color scheme. We found that brighter colors use more battery and can be interruptive when the screen is active. This app example uses a light color scheme like you typically see on phone apps using material design. The primary color chosen here is purple 500 from the material design color palette. This color is used to highlight content and actions in different sections of the app, and it does already give a distinctive look to the app. Light colors have two main issues, however. One is that light colors are less energy efficient in OLED displays because they need to light the pixels with brighter intensity. For example, white pixels need to light up the RGB diodes in your pixels at 100%. So the more white and light colors you have in your app, the less battery efficient your app will be. The other issue is more of a social nature. Imagine you're in a restaurant having a pleasant candlelight dinner. Probably in this restaurant, they run out of candles. It's really dark. And you receive a message notification from a friend. 
Because watches are visible uh, on your wrist at all times, or most of the times, if you have long sleeves, they're not going to be visible, uh, your display may disrupt the pleasant atmosphere when you get a notification. The situation would probably not happen with dark colors. Here's the same app example using a dark theme. Using the same primary color, purple 500, we arrived at all the colors that used in, the, in this example. Differently to light colors, dark colors make the screens less bright when they're active and save battery in OLED displays. We've also designed our system notifications to automatically adapt to your app color. So they create a unified experience. For your app, though, that I show here, we derived these colors using a, a method that we developed, and they are derived from the Purple 500 manually, and I'm going to show how we did it. So this is our primary color, Purple 500, from the Material Design Palette. This color can be expressed in different color notations like RGB, red, green, blue. Here we are showing the decimal values for RGB. Another common way to show the values of RGB was hexadecimal values. It's usually uh, very common in uh, web apps and Android apps as well. Yet there's another notation called hue, saturation, and brightness. And that's the notation we used to develop our color system. If you look at the app, we have hue, which is expressed in degrees, brightness in percentage, and bright, uh, excuse me, saturation in percentage, and brightness also in percentage. We man to manipulate the, uh, to create the colors, we manipulate the brightness, brightness values of this color, and we're going to show you how we did it. So let's imagine our color would just move from a color world to a black and white world, and that every subcolor could be expressed by just the brightness values of the subcolors. As you see here in the image below, purple 500. <laughs> if you bring this color back to the happy, colorful world, that's how each subcolor would look like. We named five different subcolors that we think can cover most of your app's needs. Here they are from light to dark. Accent. So as I mentioned before, we just moved the brightness values on the color. So accent, we moved the brightness up to 100%. Then you have lighter UI element, where you move down from 74% to 65, and you go down to 40% for to UI element, then 30% for lighter background, and 50% for dark, dark background. Now let's see how these colors are applied in our example. We use accent color sparingly throughout the UI. In this example, we're just like highlighting the username and the timestamp. We use the lighter background color in most of the UI's background. And to section off certain areas of the background, we decided to use the dark background color. Active elements in the UI, like elements where you take action, like the action drawer or the primary action button, they use the lighter UI element. And to separate the primary action button on the left uh, screen, uh, we use the UI element. It's almost like a intermediate, intermediary uh, background. Luckily, this color, Purple 500, isn't alone in this happy color world. They have a lot of friends. We also updated the complete, material, the complete material design color palettes to help you choose darker colors for your applications. We needed to, however, to make a few adjustments to make the palette more readable and more accessible. So we optimized the saturation for some of the subcolors in the blue range, as you see here on the image and the yellow range. If you want to know more about colors, please visit our material spec site. And the URL here is on the, the bottom corner. OK, we talked about vertical layouts and darker colors, two of the key areas of material design for wearables. Let's talk now about the last one, UI components and patterns. We walk you through the basic anatomy of a material design app for Wear 2.0. Imagine this uh, circle in isometric perspective is the screen of your watch. The app will have a vertical container with a vertical layout. And this layout, we use a dark color palette. 
And here's these two components that Paul will show it to, to uh, you how to build in your app, in your app today. Wearable action drawer and wearable navigation drawer. Let's see how they work. A navigation drawer helps users navigate between sections of your app. It sits vertically on the top of the con uh, content containers outside of the viewport. So if you look at this image here of a fake mail app that we call Mailbox, um, you see the, ver the containers for the main containers of the app, they're all vertical. And the navigation drawer sits on top of it. The navigation in the drawer is actually horizontal, and it's on purpose, because the only way to move between different horizontal containers, vertical containers, is horizontally, because I know someone's going to ask that question later. This horizontal motion helps us enter different vertical views in, their, in your application. For example, if you want to switch between mailbox to settings to contacts page to your drafts, this is how the navigation drawer works in action. It uses proof from the top, navigate between le left and right to arrive at the view. It's pretty simple. We've also implemented a peak behavior to remind users that the drawer actually exists outside of the viewport. Sometimes users may forget there's something there. The drawer peaks as soon as the user scrolls back to the top of the current view, as you see on the animation, and the drawer just peeks in. Users don't have actually to scroll all the way to the top to get to the drawer. The drawer is available, available at all times. You just have to pull from the top edge of the screen, and the drawer will be there. An action drawer, it's the one that sits on the bottom of the screen. An action drawer allows users to access actions for a specific usage context. Let's look at the example of the conversation in a messaging app. There are a few possible actions here. Could be more, but I'm just showing a few. Replying to the message, adding a photo, sharing a location, adding more people to the conversation. So to access the, the actions, users just have to pull up the drawer and tap on the overflow icon. And as we did with the navigation drawer, users can open that drawer at any time by pulling from the bottom edge of the screen. In fact, we found in usability studies that once users discover that behavior, they don't even wait for the pick state. They know the drawer is there. They just open the drawer and perform the actions. So what happens if you have only one action in your drawer? So if you have only one action, you don't need an overflow icon. So the overflow icon is help, helps you figure out there's more actions there. But we only have one. We debated whether we should have like a drawer and just the peak state with that icon in it. And we found out that sometimes if you use an icon that users have never seen before, it's useful to have a drawer with just one action. So that I can actually associate, associate the action with the icon. So tapping on the action, as you're going to see in the animation now, instead of opening the drawer, we'll perform the action directly. So in this case, when the user taps on the, uh, the action, he will, just reply, he will just reply to the conversation. To prevent unnecessary screen obstruction, the drawer also has a peek and hide behavior. In this animation, you see how the drawer disappears. And it reappears when the user is trying to go back to the bottom of the conversation. That means, let's say, you you're receive a message from a friend, and they ask you a question. You want to go back in the, in the, the conversation history. You find out what you want. As you go back down, we assume that you're trying to actually reply to the action. So we pick the drawer in for you as a convenience. In this case, maybe you just want to pull from the bottom as well. Now we'll hand it over to Paul, who will show you how to build these components. Thanks, JP. Now, you learn about the design behind drawers. And I'm going to show you how to implement them. The drawers are a new feature in the wearable support library. And if you're familiar to implementing drawers on a phone, then you pretty much already know how to implement them on a wearable as well. 
So first, we're going to go through some more generic, easy to implement use cases, the wearable action drawer and wearable navigation drawer. And afterwards, we'll take a little deeper dive and show you how to build some custom drawers if your application should be a little more tailored to the user experience. So wearable drawer layout is the container that everything goes within. Here, you're going to define your content. This is going to be the vertically scrolling thing that JSP spoke about. And within it, you're also going to define an action drawer and a wearable navigation drawer. To get the peaking behavior, you need to enable nested scrolling. What this does is it allows the wearable drawer layout to understand the movement that's occurring deeper within the view hierarchy so that it knows when to peak. For instance, when you scroll to the top, the wearable drawer layout needs to peak the navigation drawer. So you can do this by enabling nested scrolling enabled on standard Android views such as list view. Some of the Android support views like recycler view and nested scroll view implement this by default. On the left is a navigation drawer on a phone. It's generally pulled from the left side of the screen, or you tap the hamburger menu, and allows the user to navigate the application. On the right, you can see the same thing, the wearable navigation drawer, for use on watches. It's pulled down from the top of the screen, and it allows the users to navigate between different columns of vertical content. Navigation drawers are populated through the same adapter construct that you're already familiar with on Android. There's only a few message, me the methods to implement it's really easy. Let's go through building one. So you pull down the navigation drawer from the top of the screen, and you see that you're in the mailbox section. The user knows that there is one section to the left and two to the right from the indicators at the bottom of the screen. You define this by filling in the get count method from the adapter. And in, in particular, the section that the user is currently on is highlighted by a larger circle. To set the label, get item text is called, and that's what sets the label for it. And then there's also get item drawable, which sets the icon. And that's all that's needed to populate the view for a navigation drawer. It's really simple and quick. There are two other methods to discuss, on item selected and notify data set changed. On item selected is called when the user navigates left or right within the drawer. And this gives you the opportunity to change the underlying view. For instance, if the user goes from the mailbox section to the settings section, that gives you an opportunity to change the underlying content to reflect the new settings screen. Notify data set changed is called when the data backing the adapter changes after the adapter was set. This notifies the navigation drawer that the data behind it is no longer valid, and it needs to redraw the view so that it can get the new icons and labels. Action drawers are a great complement to wearable navigation drawers, and they allow the user to quickly perform actions on the content on the screen. On the left, you can see an action menu as it is implemented on a phone, generally open by clicking the overflow menu. And on the right is a wearable action drawer, open by pulling down up from the bottom of the screen. Actions on phones and wearables are both implemented using the Android menu API. If your action menu is static and it does not change, the easiest way to fill it in is to specify a menu resource in your XML. Here you can see that we created an action menu attribute, and we're just pointing it to a menu resource file. Alternatively, your actions may need to be a little more dynamic, and you can populate them in code as well. Here we're using a menu inflator to put a menu resource file into the menu that we retrieved from the action drawer. This is exactly what happens behind the scenes when you specify an attribute with XML. So if that's what you're planning on doing, then it's a little easier to point it in XML. Uh, so here we're going to clear the action menu and go through building one in code without using a resource file. So you can call on the menu object, the add method, where you're going to pass in the item ID as well as the text to use. And once that menu item has been created, you can set an icon on it. Later on, if you no longer need the menu item and want to remove it from the action drawer, you just call remove item on the menu and pass in the item ID. There are two ways to interact and retrieve events that are occurring within an action drawer. First, you can set a click listener on the entire menu. When you do this, and whenever anything in the action drawer is clicked, this method will be called. And then from within here, you can get the item ID and then act accordingly once you know what was clicked. Alternatively, you can set an individual click listener on a specific menu item. This will intercept the click event. So if the user clicks on something that had if a general menu has a defined click listener and a specific item has one as well, the specific one will be called first, and you can respond accordingly. And if you return true, 
the event will be considered consumed and will never propagate to the general click listener. One thing in particular to note is that there are two instances of on menu item click listener. The first comes from the wearable action drawer class, and this is the one that you're going to set on the entire menu. And the second one comes from the menu item class. This is what you're going to use for setting a click listener on a specific menu item. The standard navigation in action drawers, if they don't suit your application, you don't need to use them. You can create a custom one. And that gives you the peaking and drag behavior that users have come to expect on the operating system. But it allows you to put in some peak and drawer content that's more specified for your application. Let's take a look at how Spotify uses them. In the first example, you can see that they've replaced the peak icon, overflow icon with a play and pause button. And this means whenever the user is using an application, they can change the state of the music right there without having to open the drawer. And if they decide to pull the drawer up, you can see the custom drawer contents on the right. The custom drawer shows a full set of media controls and some song information, such as the title, the artist, as well as the duration and time left going around the edges of the screen. Now, Spotify could have used a regular action drawer and had all of these controls and information listed vertically. But we've come to associate moving to the next song to the right of the pause button. So in this case, it really made sense for them to create their own custom drawer and use a UI that people are already familiar with. Wearable action drawer and wearable navigation drawer both extend from the wearable drawer view class. So when you create a custom drawer, that you're going to want to use that base class and place your content within it. You need to set the layout gravity on the drawer view to, so it knows whether it exists on the top or bottom of the screen. In this example, we're using a drawer on the top. If the content within your drawer also scrolls, you'll need to enable nested scrolling again. And this just helps wearable drawer layout understand the movement that's occurring beneath so that it can make everything fluid. In your code, there are two methods in wearable drawer view. There's set peak content and set drawer content. And both of these methods take Android view arguments, and they follow all the standard view conventions. So you can set a click listener on, a, on, it if, on a peak state if you want to respond differently. In some cases, your app may need to respond depending on the drawer state. So you can use a drawer state callback, which lets you know when a drawer has been opened, closed, or the state changes. We've also defined a few states, such as dragging, when the user drags the drawer up, and if they let go a little early before they finish dragging and it has a little bit more to move before it settles in place, it'll be using the settling state. And once it's finally stopped moving, either in an open or in closed state, the state will switch to idle. Here are a few of our partners using the drawers. On the left is LifeSum. They track your food intake and they use an action drawer that you can open up to add an extra meal, whether it's breakfast, lunch, dinner, or a snack. They also implement a navigation drawer to help you move between food, water, and exercise. On the right is Todoist, and they're using an action drawer to let you take actions and add new to-do items in your list. Wearable drawers are but a few of the components available in Android Wear 2.0. If the drawers don't suit your app and they're a little too, uh, too much UI for what you need to get done, feel free to use some other principles. Here is primary action button, and this allows the user to take an action immediately upon entering a viewer activity. This is similar to a floating action button on a phone. So in the case of an email app, besides reading emails, users may want to frequently compose a new one. So here we're using a primary action button to define that right at the top of the screen and help them build that immediately. Inline action buttons should be used when it's important that the user gets to the bottom of the content before taking an action. So in this example, we put the share button at the bottom of the content, because it's really important that people read what they're sharing before they share it, right? Confirmation overlays display a temporary message to express a state change. So in this case, the user has successfully sent a message. So you're going to use the, you pass in a success confirmation overlay, and that will use the green arrow. And if you look at the API, there are a few other states defined to use different icons there. And finally, there are progress indicators, which let the user know that something is happening behind the scenes. It's important to use these if anything is not going to be instant, so that the user doesn't think your app stalled, and they know that something's coming. They just have to wait another second. All of these pieces can be combined to create a rich and tailored experience for your application on Wear. Android Wear 2.0 has a new wearable support library that includes all the components we've discussed today and more. To get this support library, you need to add a dependency to the wearable support library in your Gradle build file. 
This Gradle file is depending on the developer preview version, so it uses the suffix alpha1. The exact dependency will change throughout the preview period, and will finally settle on 2.0.0. To find the exact dependency, please visit the Wear Developer site, where you can also find guides, tutorials, and reference we put a lot of thought into material design on Wear, and we're only able to touch on a small portion of it during this session. The guidelines we've spoken about today, as well as others, are available on the Material Design for Wear spec site. And with that, I'll hand it over to JP to discuss some best practices. Thanks, Paul. Now that you learn how to design apps with material design on Wear 2.0 and how to build some of our components, let's briefly talk about some general best practices for creating smartwatch app experiences. Smartwatches have unique limitations and capabilities, and many of the design patterns and principles developed for, smartwatch, for smartphones should not be directly applied to watches. The first thing is to understand use cases. When designing apps for smartwatches, focus on use cases that make sense for the watch environment. Watches allow users to take, get information at a glance, such as the arrival of the next, next buzz, and to take actions quickly, like responding to a message. Avoid complex applications that require a lot of input and have too much information density. The best wearable apps are glanceable. That means when you look at your watch, at your wrist, you know what they're trying to tell you. They're easy to tap. You don't want you to fumble on the UI to try to take action. And help users complete, complete tasks quickly. So, Help your users go from A to B quickly. Don't add in, uh, unnecessary steps in between. They keep you connected to both the real and the virtual worlds. And we look forward to see what you come up with. Where, app, where apps should be designed to support your app's core functionality. Don't include unnecessary features, actions, or content in your app's UI. So if you look at that example of the email app, the mailbox fake app, you probably want to include the ability to reply to messages or to compose new messages. And maybe on a watch, you don't want to print your email. I mean, who does print email anyway? But like, you don't want to print email from your watch, right? Or you know, add a label or show original HTML content. Probably that's not the kind of functionality you want to have on a watch uh, app. The last thing is like, when you design for watches, design for round design uh, devices first. Unlike phones that have rectangular screens, the majority of Android Wear devices in the market have a round screen. A circle fits within a square and has a 22% smaller surface area. With that, you make sure that your layouts work both on round and square devices. Round screens have a, sim a, like, a smaller usable surface. So remember, a circle fits inside of a square. And if you put another square inside of that circle, I know this would be crazy, but the square inside that circle, that's your safe area. So don't put anything, else, uh, like important information, outside of that square, inside the circle. So the edges around <laughs> that circle, those are probably the, the parts of the, the UI that are, you want to put your secondary information. They're also pretty small, so you don't want to, for example, in that top edge of the circle, if you put a, squeeze a title there, it's going to be very small. So for primary information, use that center of the circle. The same is for text. For laying out text in a circular device, you also have to observe the same margins. And margins for circular devices have to be a little bit wider to have a more pleasant, uh, pleasant experience. So how do you build for both round and square devices? Well, we added some new resource qualifiers to help you do this. On the top, we have in, under our resources a values dash not round. So here we're going to define things that we want to use for our square screens. So in the dimensions file, we have a left padding defined with 12 dp. So this just moves the, the content in a little bit from the bezel and gives a little white space to make a better user experience. As JP just discussed, on round screens, you're going to want to move content in a little more. So on the bottom, we're defining a values-round folder. And within that, we're creating another dimensions file. Here, we're overriding the left padding to use 36 dp. So here, if you're using a round device, at runtime, 
the application will choose which to use. So it, in this case, it'll use 36 and push the content in a little further away from the edge. This doesn't just apply to the values folder, but anything in the resource directory. So for instance, you can have uh, layout dash round if you want a completely different layout for a round device. It's important to use your apps as a user would. You may develop docked at your desk or on an emulator, but watches are worn on a wrist. For this new form factor, it's very important that this, you do some real-world testing, which you may not be as used to with a phone. A great way to test is to get up, put your watch on, go outside, and maybe take a run. Imagine you're building a fitness application, and everything works great at your desk. You follow the material design principles. Everything's really fluid and snappy. It's great. But before you ship it to users, you put it on and go for a run. Once you're exercising and breathing heavily, you may notice that the buttons that were really easy to click at your desk are a little bit more difficult when your wrist is moving around and creates a moving target because you're breathing heavily. So now you go back to your desk, create the buttons a little larger, and by the time you ship it, users are going to have a great experience. Thank you for attending this session. JP and I really hope you enjoyed it. We want to teach you not only how to design and build wearable apps, but also why the design decisions we made are practical for small and various form factors. You can start building apps today by going to g.co slash wear preview. The next session in this room is on watch faces and complications. And if you've missed any of the sessions today, they'll all be available on YouTube shortly. One of the reasons we're doing this preview is to get your feedback. So please, use the wearable preview. And if you have any API suggestions or find any bugs, you can let us know at g.co slash wear preview bug. Thank you very much. Thank you.